Good morning. Uh, I would like to thank for the invitation to Prague, to Sudan and Alessandro. <laughs> and, uh, oh, here we have the presentation. Can I use the pointer, please? Uh, it's a uh, mouse. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah it works. So, the first slide, just to explain two words. CHAMP is the Czech MPD group. SEMPO is the Central uh, European Myeloproliferative Organization. Come on. Disclosures. Issues to address. I'll be very, very uh, fast because I have to address many things, because if we want to talk about treatment, we have to talk also about the risk factors. I'm sorry the mouse doesn't work much. So, uh, back to the general principles of management. Just three points. Treatment should do no harm. The principle of uh, primum non nocere. The harm is the eventual hazards of the treatment should be weighted against the risks of the untreated disease or alternative treatment option. And third, knowledge of the disease risk factors should be translated into prevention of the complication, not only secondary prevention after they do occur. The risk factors in ET are just based on the Damaschek's observation in the 50s, talking about the double geopardy of the parallel risks of thrombosis and bleeding. And the biological long-term risks are not very valid in ET because ET trans, uh, trans, uh, translates into myelofibrosis uh, very late after the onset. And uh, secondary AML MDS is quite rare if we don't provoke it by our treatment. The seminal risk factors were recognized in Bergamo by the Tiziano's group, Sergio Cortellazzo. It's the well-known study uh, showing uh, the basic uh, risks, that is age and antecedent trom uh, thrombotic event. Note, also they noted Duration of exposure of elevated platelet counts increases the thrombotic risk in that study. A great inspiration for our guidelines was the Italian Society Hematology Guideline uh, by Tiziano and Al in 2004. See, they used also uh, prothrombotic comorbidity and thrombophilia to decide whether to treat or not to treat. And uh, just this is a slide on the consensus risk parameters. Again, Cortellazzo age previous thrombotic uh, event. But there are other risk factors which are quite well recognized. Uh, Tiziano et al. Uh, have formed the IPSET criteria but uh, they were not much incorporated in the treatment guidelines uh, currently. There is the JAK2 mutation, for instance, the vascular factors. Many factors are still so-called, let's call it matter of debate, which are the blood cell counts and thrombophilia. Uh, I'll talk about the blood cell counts because a Bergamo study of Alessandra Carobio has shown uh, there are two publications on it that uh, the white blood cells, but low platelet, platelets predict arterial thrombosis, which was a bit surprising to the community. Uh, this is my favorite slide, uh, a meta-analysis of the double geopardy of thrombosis and bleeding. Here you, you have the platelet counts and on this axis, you have the risk of, uh, of the event. So here you have the double geopardy. This was done by my teacher, Jan-Jacques Michels, 
And here you have also depicted the tactics of treatment for these situations. It was based on a meta-analysis. Now, to the blood cell counts at the times of diagnosis in relation to thrombosis in history and during follow-up in the Czech registry data. It's the Czech registry of enegrolide-treated patients. Currently, we have 2,000 patients. This analysis was done on nearly 1,200 patients. And here you can see that at the time of diagnosis, we have exactly the same result as uh, the Italian group, that the green field is the p-value, uh, and in green it is the inverse relationship. That means that low platelets really do predict uh, higher thrombotic rates, whereas higher white blood cells predict thrombosis. But uh, we have, uh, we have uh, prospective data. The patients are seen uh, every month during the first six months and later in the three months intervals. Here you have uh, the medium of all, all entries, of all data entries of the individual uh, cell perimeter. And now you can see that uh, the old thrombotic events, but also arterial, venous, and microvascular events, all of them have higher platelet counts before the thrombotic event, as well as they do have higher white blood cells. So the explanation is, of course, that uh, probably a diagnosis who has higher platelet counts he receives more treatment because treatment is one of the major prognostic factors and uh, those with uh, less platelet counts don't get the site reductive treatment. So this is probably the reason. The risk factors of thrombosis in the univariate analysis in the Czech registry see age predicts arterial thrombosis as well as smoking, hypertension, diabetes, not surprising. This is a bit uh, fun. The green field says that uh, patients with elevated cholesterol has, have less thrombosis. I remember a Spanish study uh, from Carlo Besses in 1999, I believe, They've published that elevated cholesterol is connected with a higher rate of thrombosis, which is, uh, of course, uh, makes sense. But here, this is some 17 years uh, after that, and you see that patients with elevated cholesterol receive statins, and statins are highly preventive uh, for uh, thrombotic episodes. There's a British study showing that statins uh, diminish JAK2 stat signalization. Uh, elevated triglycerides are still prognostically bad, and here in the center you see JAK2 mutation, and this is connected with either arterial and venous thrombosis. Here, after, below the line, you have specific thrombophilic markers jointly, which predict venous thrombosis. Individually, also, there was, was a significance for Leiden and protein C deficiency. And you see other markers, anticoagulant, antiphospholipids, factor, uh, elevated factor eight levels, and so on. Elevated homocysteine connected with arterial thrombosis. On multivariate analysis, the, the risk factors differ for arterial and venous uh, thrombosis. So uh, we've uh, evaluated separately arterial hypertension, JAK2 mutation, elevated triglycerides, and age over 65 make the difference, while in venous thrombosis, we have the specific thrombophilic markers jointly in evaluation, JAK2 mutation, and cholesterol elevation uh, as a single marker with the hazard uh, overall risk 
0.6, that is uh, diminishing the risk. These are different guidelines uh, in, in the literature uh, and what do they use for, for uh, being a risk. You see that JAK2 mutation was only uh, uh, incorporated by the CHEM group and then by Tiziano uh, in 2012 and we have it in the sample guideline of 2011. The players, I don't need to uh, talk about them much. Uh, on the MPN playground, hydroxyra, anagrolite, interference, and aspirin uh, all have uh, some pros and cons. I won't go into much detail, just to remark on hydroxyra, the best tolerated drug at the start efficient, predictable, while the con is it may be leukemogenic or carcinogenic, whereas the others are not. The playground uh, for the players, uh, for the same players, this is the map uh, showing Miki has, uh, Miki Hrubiško in Slovakia has, did, has done this cartoon. Countries with other guidelines that uh, the ELN based, quite considerable area. And these are the countries that are currently uh, together uh, within the SEMPO, the Central European Malproliferative Organization. What is the difference between the Western and let's say the Central European or alternative treatment guidelines? Uh, they are listed both here the Western based on the British uh, guidelines and the ELN guidelines. These are the Czech guidelines, Croatian guidelines, uh, but also Nordic guidelines are different and German guidelines with, with Austria and Switzerland differ. So uh, the principal differences between the two. First, hydroxyra is allowed in ELN, even in younger, individuals, whereas uh, in CHEMP or Central European it is not uh, on the long term. Uh, in younger patients, uh, PD study was serving a rationale for ELN and the British, whereas we don't think that PT1 study was well designed to be the rationale indeed. Genotoxicity of hydroxyra is deemed insufficiently proven in ELN whereas we think genotoxicity of hydroxyurea is sufficiently proven. Platelet counts are not so important for the thrombosis in ELN language, while in ours it is. Cytoreduction is used in ELN to prevent bleeding <laughs> in the higher platelet counts or only the recurrence of thrombosis, whereas in our attitude it is Site reduction is to prevent both the first thrombosis and bleeding. And fourth, age and previous thrombosis are more important than the cardiovascular risk factors, JAK2 and thrombophilia, because they have the high risk, the low risk, and JAK2 and thrombophilia is something uh, just considered as, as a secondary risk that uh, Tiziano with um, Elu Teferi, um, uh, they have now four risk categories even. But to go to the original publication, you see just the low risk and high risk patients and the attitude, watch and wait, and uh, to use hydroxyurea when you have over one and a half million platelets or when the patient is high risk. Uh, the CHEMP guidelines, uh, uh, we have low risk only here, up to 65, without JAK2, asymptomatic, no thrombophilia, these are the yellow ones, while the pink ones are all high-risk patients with different attitudes, and we prefer to use anagrolide or interferon with aspirin in that setting, but we don't use aspirin after when the platelet count is over one. Thousand. This is also thromboferesis uh, and the guideline how to use it. 
Uh, this is the incidence of the thrombotic uh, factors in the real life in the Czech registry. You see that arterial uh, thrombosis diminished twice, microvascular events, but what, what is striking, the venous thrombosis uh, diminished to sixfold. Bleeding is twice as high, but never major. Uh, this is exceptional to have a major bleeding event, only minor epistaxis. Nordic guidelines are different. They use interferon first line in, in the youngsters. The German guidelines uh, with uh, Austria and Switzerland, they use either hydroxyurea, hydroxyurea anagrolide or interferon. They differ in the first line availability uh, and for the intermediate risk, same as uh, barbuyan teferi aspirin. The rationale for sample guidelines, I have already addressed the first two points, that is the risk factors, uh, the previous thrombosis and so on. So now I'll spend a couple of slides on these three uh, remaining. The cytoreduction treatment reduces the risk of uh, thrombosis. Again, a seminal study coming from Bergamo with hydroxyurea. Uh, the ECLAP study shows that anti-aggregation in PV uh, saves arterial thrombosis, but if you compare arterial and total thrombosis, you can infer that even ESA prevents even venous thrombosis. And blocking the platelet function shows how important platelets are in thrombosis. There are many in vitro studies showing leukemogenicity with uh, increasing genetic instability, inhibition of DNA repair. Uh, we know that we cannot separate the, uh, the uh, function of ribonucleotide reductase, which is key for uh, prevention of DNA, uh, DNA replication, but also seminal for DNA repair. There are many studies showing that uh, these uh, clinical studies showing that 17p mutations may occur in patients treated with hydroxyurea. This is the French PV study showing that hydroxyurea increases uh, secondary leukemia after 10 years of treatment. So you have, a, you have to in mind that if you use one or two years of hydroxyurea, you don't, won't do much harm. Uh, I'll skip these slides to be in time. Uh, Bernasconi has shown a trace of hydroxyurea uh, for the 17P deletions, which, were, which was very nicely shown in California, saying that uh, deletions of 17P are significantly more common in patients treated with hydroxyurea. This is the skin toxicity the skin dermatosis, even with aberrant upper, uh, epidermal P53 expression. This is everything famous, the skin toxicity and cancerogenicity. This is a cancerogenicity study from Czech Republic showing no secondary tumors. So to summarize on leukemogenicity, the body of experimental and clinical evidence on the deleterious effects leukemogenicity and carcinogenicity is growing. According to some, but not to sample, it is still too early to conclude. There is an ethical question. If we suspect a drug from serious side effect, why to choose it uh, if other drugs devoid of this harmful effect are at hand according to the non nocere principles? And Sempo claims we do not need to wait for the results of randomized prospective trials to be cautious with hydroxyurea, especially in younger patients, and avoid it as much as possible. This is the Sempo guidelines, which is a bit uh, similar to the Czech one, a bit simplified, uh, but again, only two, again, only two risks 
up to 65 years and over 65 years. And you, you see that anegrolidone interferon plus aspirin is used. We don't use aspirin uh, when platelet counts are over 1,000 and never over 1,500. Uh, and this is my conclusions. Treatment of ET should aim at prevention of thrombosis. It should be adapted to risk stratification of thrombosis and bleeding. Treatment should do no harm, as ET is relatively a good boy, as, as this guy here. And uh, long-term administration of potential leukemic leukemogenic drugs, including hydroxyurea, should be avoided in patients with long-term uh, life expectancy. In younger patients, anegrelide or interferon is indicated as first-line treatment, and simple guidelines respect these principles, and there is a consensus in Central Europe. And this is my thanks to, to the audience, of course, for uh, listening to me and for my colleagues in the CHEM group and the sample groups. Thank you.